May I come in, sir? Come in, come in. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Akhil. Yes, sir. Rinjala Kuda. Yes, sir. Rinjala Kuda is famous for? So it is famous for Kudal Manikim Temple, which is a temple. temple? Kudal Manikim Temple, which houses the deity Bharata. It is one of the famous temple. Uh, I think the only temple. Uh, only temple in the country. Yes. You have visited that temple? Yes, sir, several times. Several times. <coughs> uh, have you visited Pichi also? Pichi? Uh, yes, I have visited it once. Mm -hmm. uh, once? It's quite near to you? Uh, not very near, sir, because I um, live a bit far from Pichi. Uh, so it's like uh, 40 kilometers from my place. In Delhi, even 60 kilometers is a small distance. Yes, sir. Only 40? Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, Comparatively a smaller distance. What is sir. there in Pichi? So Pichi is famous for its dam as well as a sanctuary um, which is there. So that is how it is famous sir. That's all? Uh, Very big institute is there? Yes sir, forest institute sir. Are you, are you referring to the forest institute sir? Yes, uh, it's, what, what is the full name? Sir, Kerala forest, forest Research Institute. And there is another institute there? Some banana related to banana? Uh, sir, I am not very much aware of it, sir. Okay. Atta Pari, you did some work? Yes, sir. Uh, what was that? Part? Sir, it was basically a legal aid as well as legal awareness camp that we did in Atta Pari. It was during my third year in law school that we organized it. So, it was basically aimed at uh, the ugly part of Atta Pari Taluk. Uh, so, when we went there, we understood that their problems are not just related to law. But there are several socio-economic problems that, fa that they face as a society. So that is our work in our party. What are the problems? Sir, um, there are a couple of factors. Firstly, there is rampant alcohol addiction in parts of our party. So the rehabilitation part is a missing link at this point of time. So uh, secondly, there is also a gap of health infrastructure that is there in our party. There was some externally edit project for our party. Uh, so, as far as I understand, there was a collaboration between AHARTS as well as uh, some multilateral institutions like World Bank funded projects for Atta Party. Uh, but uh, with the interaction with uh, the tribal people over there, what we understood was that most of the projects are not the demand of the tribal population. Rather, it is conceived uh, as a top-down approach, which uh, they don't find it very beneficial for them. But a lot of money is being poured in that area. Still, nothing is happening? Yes, sir. Um, I won't say that nothing is happening at that point because from 2013 uh, to 2018 if we take the statistics there has been an improvement in terms of infant mortality rate which was at a very high level in 2013 and also in terms of health indicators because of the community kitchen and all there is a significant gap reduction which has happened but the problem is that uh, any development project should also take people into confidence what they need what they really aspire to achieve. I think that has not been the case when it comes to several development aid, especially in terms of agriculture. Chief Justice of India gave some lecture, memorial lecture. Yes. He told something. Uh, so, um, uh, so what are you specifically referring to, sir? Hmm? If I may ask for a clarification. Specific, uh, it has come in all the newspapers. You would have told one or two specific, that's why it's there. Sorry, and sir. There so many lectures are there by so many dignitaries. Yes. Something about uh, Having an independent body for uh, CBI and all? Sorry, sir. I, I, I'm okay. not aware of it, sir. Hmm? I'm not aware yeah, of There it. should be a body under which the CBI and ED and... You know ED? What is ED? Yes, enforce, Enforcement Directorate. And uh, <coughs> serious fraud office would come. No? Yes, sir. Okay. That's okay. Which is the biggest article in the constitution? Which is having number of clauses? Sir, so, number of clauses? Sir, I fear I don't know the answer for that, sir. You are uh, you are having something blogging also constitutional law and government. Yes, sir. You are a law graduate. Sir, I will definitely check upon that, mm -hmm. sir. Two forty three. Two forty three. It's about. So, um, sir, I fear I can't recollect at this point, sir. Hmm? I can't recollect at this point, sir. Okay, our right to education. Yes, sir. Hmm. So it is mentioned in Article Twenty One A. Hmm. of the constitution. It was introduced as a part of an amendment in 2009. Uh, and even before that, uh, it was interpreted as part of Article 21 in several cases like Mohini Jain as well as Unikrishnan JP versus Andhra Pradesh. 
but i think uh, it is still a work in process in india acha okay now there is some law also now right yes, to education right to education act of 2009 this covid backlog you know in the <coughs> last 5 6 months after this third wave there is a covid backlog of deaths from kerala continuous yes, you know sir. about that yes sir what can be the reason so um, when it comes to kerala's handling of covid there are two factors which always comes out because in the first wave kerala was able to significantly manage the case lot it was because of an effective management at the local level which it was able to undertake but after a point of time there was a pandemic fatigue which happened in the system at the systemic level so i think that has played uh, uh, played as a big factor in terms of covid management as such and secondly i think there is a good reporting in kerala that is also a factor why um, most of the deaths was reported even at a later stage as well so it is also part of being a right conscious society perhaps that kerala is having that high reporting so uh, good reporting delayed reporting also will put into good reporting um so it I've, was a deliberate attempt from the by the government because during election times they didn't reveal those figures and those figures now started coming out continuously for 4 5 months you know that that before this uh, third wave or 45 less than 45000 Now it's grown sixty-seven, sixty-eight thousand. Certainly, sir. Uh, but I think uh, it 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 is also attributed as a political reason. But at the same time, uh, when from the government's point of view, what the government has said was that the criterion in order to report for the death as a result of COVID has changed. So that may be one factor which should have played as a factor. Uh, because uh, when but it comes that to that way, criteria once it is changed, let all the deaths backlog. be announced at one time why slowly every day 100 out of if it is 150 in the whole country 125 will be from kerala yes sir so daily it was like this yes sir <coughs> that is a factor that is that is a uh, that is a very uh, correct observation that has happened in terms of kerala uh, but the so has kerala is is and is has been having a very good image that their reporting is truthful and all so now all the image is gone Uh, but sir um, i would like to clarify that even though it was a delayed reporting i would say that uh, reporting at any stage is beneficial even for the victims as well um, so no, no, it is not uh, for the good beneficial but government got the benefit eh? the same party came in power because of this covid handling yes sir which is not true now yes sir, to an extent uh, i would like to agree with the uh, observation that you made sir okay what do you know about kerala gold case yes sir uh, when it comes to kerala gold case it was um, a matter of a diplomatic baggage containing embezzled gold so uh, that was uh, one factor so it involved several facets of diplomatic immunity as well as mishandling of power even from the cm's office there were the, the those were the accusations which were leveled against uh, ag- leveled by the opposition against the ruling party at that point of time Uh, but at this point of time it is still an ongoing investigation and it's also a matter which is subjudice in nature sir no only the status or the other or yes, let go uh, it is died down politically and in terms of the attention that it gets mm. but it is an ongoing investigation still what happened to those actors in that this uh, thing who are all main actors um, so uh, there was a uh, there were two or three people who were involved uh, one was Uh, the ias officer uh, m shivashankar sir he was uh, he was uh, one of the involved parties over there who was a point of interest and there was a lady who was involved uh, she was named sapna suresh uh, but um, i think it is an ongoing case so nothing is finalized in that case okay. what do you know about coffee posa yes sir um, it is a legislation which basically attempts um it it is it is a legislation which attempts to curb all kinds of illegal foreign transactions um uh, prevention of smuggling these are the main agendas of that act hmm. what is the main feature of that uh, sir i am not very sure of the details <coughs> of that act sir hmm. but i will certainly check upon that sir have you heard of gundos act yes sir what is that so uh, gunda act um, especially in the state of kerala it was used to curb all kinds of activities what is the main feature in that 
so it it enlisted certain people uh, as gundas who uh, who was involved in the illegal use of force against people and uh, they were targeted and uh, in terms of the measures that were undertaken by kerala they were asked to flee from that particular place as such and some people were also incarcerated as a result of the gunda act what does what do you call that incarceration so uh, we can call it a preventive detention so coffee pots also yes sir is for preventive detention, detention for smugglers yes sir all right yes sir so how many people have been booked under coffee pots in this case um so i'm not sure of it sir okay. when you go for preventive detention what is the maximum period uh, one can be kept under the law so uh, as far as i recollect it is 3 months mm -hmm. and later on it can be extended to 6 months upon mm -hmm. uh, concurrence from a judicial body but i'm not sure of the legal sir mm -hmm. that is okay <coughs> what are the safeguards uh, we have against this uh, preventive detention that uh, excess use of authority in the guise of uh, these acts yes sir so in the case of preventive detention firstly there is a right that always uh, flows from article 21 and apart from that in terms of detention under preventive laws there is a time limit that is prescribed <coughs> and any further extension of that time limit should be with the concurrence of a judicial finding and judicial body I think that is uh, the restriction that is attached to it. Okay. Enough of law. Yes, What is the recent controversy in Kerala about uh, highways project? Uh, so, uh, can you just clarify? Highways sir? project. Highways project, sir. Uh, so, there is a controversy regarding coastal highway, and as well as a project uh, that is running along with it, that is KRL as well. Uh, with regard to coastal highway. What is it called? What is the project name? So, coastal highway project is there, and the line or what is that? So, the uh, so are you referring to the K Rail project, ah. the semi high speed railway project that is there in Kerala? So, um, that controversy is regarding. Uh, firstly, there is a detailed project report that has been submitted. It is construed as being incomplete, and secondly, the economic viability of that project because it is funded by the Japanese corporation. Uh, mm. That is also under question because the projection that has been made by the government, it is alleged by the opposition as well as. many other independent actors that that is unviable in nature and thirdly it is also proposed as not an environmentally sound project but government has an alternate vision regarding that government says that it runs on green energy so it is environmentally sound and uh, because kerala is an urban continuum these projections are valid that is what the government says then law right yes sir what is this concept of rule of law so rule of law is often attributed to the british scholar av dicey Mm. he says that no one is above law uh, no one yeah, can no, no one, one is above, above law okay. no one can be punished except by the distinct breach of law and everyone is equal before law these are the primary concepts with respect do to rule of law do you have rule of law in our country yes sir certainly i do believe and what is rule by law so rule by law um, as far as i understand is rule upon certain statutory principles like we have a constitution in india upon which this country is being governed so that is what i believe sir but there are countries say pakistan you have more than their constitution they have sharia law so what is that so even in terms of that um, there are several laws which operates at different domain mm -hmm. i would say that uh, in a country constitution might may be construed as the ground norm upon which all of the laws are based so even in india personal laws are the personal laws govern different transaction when it comes when it concerns individual in the terms of family marriage etc so that is also another facet of rule by law itself sir good now tell me the difference between judicial activism and judicial overreach take one by one and give one example also yes sir so when it comes to judicial activism it mm -hmm. is judiciary playing an active role in the socio economic development of a country in a very positive way but sticking to its own domain expertise uh, when it comes to the idea of public interest litigation especially in terms of securing the human rights of prisoners in india that was a very positive role which was taken by the judiciary even in terms of providing legal aid in cases like husanar akatun mh hoscott that can be construed as an element of judicial activism but when it comes to judicial overreach mm -hmm. here the judiciary steps outside its prescribed limit and it preaches the notion of separation of power 
for example when mm. um, judiciary ordered for a ban on sale of liquor in highways that is basically a domain of executive that's a policy matter that the judiciary should have restrained from so i think that is called as judicial overreach sir so the overreach is happening more than once now quite frequently can i say yes sir especially the supreme court yes, whether it is pollution or anything they yes, come up with this no so i would certainly agree to that statement sir yeah that uh, no icj yes sir. what is this icj so icj is international court of justice mm-hmm. which how many judges are there Yes, sir. in International Court of Justice, there are fifteen judges. Fifteen, sure. Sir, that is what I recollect. Okay, any Indian? Yes, at sir. At the moment? Yes, sir. Uh, there is Justice Bandari who mm. retired from the Supreme Court. Yeah. Recently, he voted on certain issue, which was totally against our stand in a way. Can you recall that particular thing? Yes, sir. It was vote against Russia because yeah. Russian action was considered as against uh, international law. but i certainly feel that being a judge he should be objective in nature and need not stick with a national policy as such uh, because i think certain amount of objectivity in terms of his decision should be attributed to because we follow that kind of system in india how effective do you think this icj is really is it like any other un agency type not effective passing resolution etc Uh, so uh, when it comes to icj icj's mm. effectiveness hinges on mm. nations as such um in in terms of very powerful nations like the us us has always desisted from following icj's orders especially mm-hmm. nicaragua case and all even yeah. russia or china is not different how about pakistan we have our case there no and some that which case i am referring to yes sir you referring to kulbushan jatav case yeah. yes sir in What terms huh? yes sir in terms of that i feel that in kulbushan jatav case pakistan has at least partially complied with an order uh, partially yes okay but still you know it is more than 2 years i suppose na only partially yes sir good now let's talk briefly about the budget huh? you are familiar with the budget yes sir to an extent sir ha you are somewhat okay very simple question what do you understand the ease of living yes sir ease of living can be construed as the way in which basic necessities of life are being fulfilled by an individual right so uh, that comes through various methods uh, accessibility of food clothing and also all other basic avenues of life as such so the affordability factor and uh, the way that you live with dignity all that counts good but kindly uh, related to budget in budget there are some announcements which should make our life easy are you aware of that um, sir i can't recall that recall that in this point let me give you a clue about the assessment Are you aware of that? Um, so I can't recall, sir. Have you heard of faceless assessment? Yes, sir. So don't you think that's a big deal? Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Okay. Faceless and painless. Okay, last question. What is ease of doing business? Sir, ease of doing business is, hmm. um, in fact, a concept which is mooted by the World Bank. Hmm. Uh, the way in which a nation opens up to business, hmm. how laws are designed, hmm. how easily a business uh, corporation can be incorporated in their country, and the ease of exit as well. So, in terms of India, uh, World Bank has always rated India uh, at a very high level at this point of time. Uh, I think it, India was ranked sixty-three uh, last time it was conducted. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the problem was always with respect to contract enforcement, which made India's rank poor at times. Thank you. Contract enforcement. Enforcement. Okay. In the beginning, you mentioned about legal awareness. Yes. Okay. That it is required. So, which sections of the society where you feel it is required the most? Yes, ma'am. When it comes to legal awareness, I feel that it should start from schooling itself, because students should be uh, made empowered first with law. So, even from basic schooling, law should be uh, taught as a subject. Secondly, I think law should be taken to the vulnerable section, who are often. been kept out of the legal that's system i'm saying that's why i'm asking which is the most vulnerable section where it is required the most ma'am i would say the scheduled caste the mm-hmm. tribals and women and women okay suppose there's a lady who is facing domestic violence but she's not coming forward because of social stigma so you how would you address that problem not as a lawyer but as a civil servant Mm. Yes, and these are very regular cases in your area. Yes, ma'am. 
Now, uh, when it comes to the idea of domestic violence, I feel that the primary problem is the notion of patriarchy that exists in the society. So I think the capacity building should start at home when they are children. So I think that should be the primary step. But when a woman approaches me as if an administrator. What I'm trying to say, because of social stigma, she's not coming forward. And it is prevalent in the area where you, uh, you know, you're working. So how would you address this problem? She will not come to you, but that problem is there and you know about the problem. How would you address uh, in such a scenario? How will you address this problem? Ma'am, I think the system should reach them. So that would be the primary solution. Um, that is firstly, we can come up with mobile telephonic numbers, which they can easily access. And there should be counselors who are female so that uh, there will be easier accessibility and communication that can happen with them. And thirdly, even from the system side, there should be a kind of an empathy that should be displayed to all kinds of victim. And uh, at a systemic level, there should also be a concerted effort within the society to generate awareness that any kind of domestic violence is a crime in itself and victims should be treated with empathy and not with stigma. And I think that kind of campaign should happen simultaneously. But there's a fear in the society that, you know, if she comes forward, then the situation can get worse. So how does she handle such a situation? What steps would you take in order to ensure about her safety? Yes, ma'am. Uh, firstly, I will use the avenues that is provided in the Domestic Violence Act itself. That is, there are protection orders that can be granted to such women. And they should be rescued and rehabilitated in a place that they feel secure. So I think there should be government-run centers for that, wherein a person who is out of domestic violence is uh, placed in a very secure environment. And thirdly, if they are not economically empowered, some kind of financial aid should be given to them and some kind of avenues for employment should also be open up to them so that they can live without fear and with independence in such an environment with state support. Okay. What about delaying cases? The cases they start and they never get closed. It takes years and years. So what do you think could be the remedy for this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, delay of cases happens at several levels, mm -hmm. uh, even at the apex court and also at the trial stages. In the apex court, I feel that the sheer diversity is the main problem. So um, the Supreme Court should confine itself to original jurisdiction and constitutional matters. Rather than that, we can have appellate courts at different levels, at different regional benches. That would be the solution at the highest level. But when it comes to the trial court matter, the uh, trial court issues, the matter is more grave in nature. So I think there we can pursue the method of alternate dispute resolution at the civil stages, wherein it takes years and years to resolve. So ADR mechanism is one. Secondly, the infrastructure at the trial court should improve to a great extent. And judges to population ratio, that should be addressed to a great extent. And judicial recruitment at the trial stages has to improve to, a, to uh, at least a level which is manageable in society. And fourthly, I feel that there should be an effective case management system that should be instituted in all courts. Okay, as a lawyer, if you are handling a case, what will be your priority? I mean, as in like, uh, uh, in terms of timelines, how would you uh, handle that with your client? Will it be a time bound thing or will it be an ongoing thing? How would you, uh, you know, handle such a scenario with your client? Would you actually care? Would your intention will be there to, you know, uh, close the case within a time limit? Or uh, since you know the lawyers are handling multiple cases at one time, they don't have time. So, I mean, is there uh, is, uh, some kind of government intervention in required to make it time bound? And certainly, I feel that way because there should be government intervention to make it time bound. Uh, there are certain problems that is often associated with the idea of litigation in this country. That is, lawyers often keep the case posted and delayed. So that happens as part of but provision. why does it happen? Uh, Ma'am, uh, exactly the issue that you pointed out, that some lawyers take up cases which is not manageable by them. So I think that should change. Uh, that is, there should be a professional code of conduct which makes them or which mandates them to only take up cases which are manageable. Okay, what is faster? It was a news. Fast tank. Fast and secure transmission of electronic records. Ma'am, uh, I'm not aware of it now. Okay. 
Fine. Do you watch Netflix? Yes, ma'am. Have you seen Suits? No, ma'am. You haven't seen. Okay. And uh, you watch movies in cinema? Yes, ma'am. And this national anthem, compulsive national anthem, what is your view on that? Ma'am, uh, I would term it as an instance of judicial overreach by the Supreme Court. Because I feel that um, any kind of patriotism need not be forced in nature. Especially in a movie theatre, I don't think that it may be the right place to display any kind of patriotism. But having said that, it was a right, it was, it was a judgment which came out of the right intention. But uh, I do not agree with the reasoning which was provided by the judge. Okay, fine. Thank you.